Welcome to Sound Bites, hosted by registered dietitian nutritionist Melissa Joy Dobbins. Let's delve into the science, the psychology, and the strategies behind good food and nutrition. Hello, and welcome to the Sound Bites podcast. Today's episode is about brain health, cognition, and diet, choosing the best foods for brain health. I have two expert guests today. The first is Dr. Mickey Rubin. He's the executive director of the Egg Nutrition Center and the Nutrition Science Education Division of the American Egg Board. He graduated from Indiana University Bloomington with a Bachelor of Science degree in kinesiology, then earned a master's degree in exercise and sports science from the University of Memphis, later earning a PhD in exercise physiology from the University of Connecticut, where his research interests included exercise endocrinology, sports nutrition, and the effects of dietary interventions on cardiometabolic health outcomes. My other guest is Kitty Broyer. She's a dietitian and the nutrition advisor and spokesperson for the Wild Blueberry Association of North America. She is also the owner of Nutracom Incorporated, a food and nutrition communications company in Portland, Maine. Welcome to the show, Mickey and Kit. Thank you. Thank you for having us. So before we dive into the topic of brain health, I would love to hear more from each of you about your backgrounds, the work you do, and especially related to the topic of brain health and cognition. Well, I've been working with the Wild Blueberry Association for about seven years, but Prior to that, I actually started out in the magazine industry as an editor at Good Housekeeping Magazine when I was fresh out of grad school and a newly minted dietitian uh, RD. So I've come mostly through a communications path to this topic, but I'm really in love with this topic. I think it is, I mean, obviously impacts everyone. We all have a brain. Mm -hmm. And the fact that we can maybe help ourselves through diet, I think is really exciting. It's a different area than just thinking about weight control or, you know, heart health. It's just really exciting. And there's just a huge amount of research being done right now for a variety of foods and how they can, you know, impact brain health. Excellent. Mickey, what about you? Yeah, so as you mentioned, I work at the Egg Nutrition Center, uh, which is part of the American Egg Board. So I work on behalf of U.S. egg farmers. Uh, I've had the pleasure of doing that for the past three plus years. And so what we do at Egg Nutrition Center is we fund nutrition science research in various areas. And then we have a team of dietitians that communicate on those findings to dietitians and other health professionals. This is actually my second uh, stopover at an organization working on behalf of farmers. Before that, I was with National Dairy Council working on behalf of dairy farmers uh, in a very similar position, overseeing their nutrition research program as vice president of nutrition research. And I think when you think of eggs, you think of, you know, obviously, and if you know Egg Nutrition Center, a long history of research in the area of heart health and cholesterol uh, going back decades. But I think what's really exciting is now we're starting to look at other aspects of the egg and specifically the nutrients in eggs that have been linked to cognitive outcomes, both at the early stages and later stages of life. Excellent. Yes. And my regular listeners will know, Mickey, you were on the show back on episode 131 talking about eggs and cognition and nutrition and also some culinary applications. And you and I crossed paths back when I worked for the Dairy Council as well. And we're both based here in Chicago. And Kit, you are based in Portland, Maine. So wonderful. Yeah. I actually have another comment about what Mickey said, because It's interesting how the egg industry has shifted and expanded on their areas of interest regarding health research. But for wild blueberries, we've always been about brain and cognition and heart health. Those are like our two areas. And the link between heart health and brain is something that, you know, people Uh are getting more and more familiar with. But when he said in the last couple of decades they've been doing brain health, that's all we've done is brain health since we started to fund research, which was basically in the very early 90s, late 80s. Now, in full disclosure, this episode is a partnership with the Egg Nutrition Center and the Wild Blueberry Association of North America, and we thank them for their sponsorship and support. So we have a lot of interesting 
tips and research to share, but we also have a wonderful resource called the Cognition Kitchen Guide that we'll be referring to throughout the conversation, and we'll be sharing in the resources in the show notes at soundbitesrd.com. But let's start off with what may seem obvious, you know, brain health is important, but I would love for both of you to speak to specifically why it's important and why at any age. Uh, Mickey, let's start with you. Well, I think, you know, from a nutrition perspective, I think this is a really exciting area. You know, those of us who've worked in nutrition for many years, we're obviously have a lot of experience in areas like heart disease and diabetes and overweight and obesity. But I think what is increasingly becoming appreciated in the last several years is the impact of diet on cognitive function at both the beginning stages of life as well as through later stages of life. We're seeing some really exciting new research that is linking specific nutrients and foods to optimal cognitive development in children and continuing throughout later in life. So I think it's taking the field in a really important direction. Wonderful. Kit, would you like to add anything? I totally agree with everything Mickey said. I also believe that people are seeing, you know, increased incidences or prevalence of things like Alzheimer's disease or dementia. And they see that in people they know. And then that just gets them thinking, what can I do to do everything I can to prevent that? And I also think that people are starting to learn that brain health is a variety of things. It's not just, you know, how smart you are or something like that. Mm. So I think giving attention to the different aspects of brain health, such as cognition or motor function or, you know, emotional function, all of those things are part of brain health. Mm -hmm. And the fact that we could possibly impact how our brain health continues through our life through diet is pretty empowering for most people. Excellent. Let's talk more specifically about how diet is related to brain health. What does the science show? And Kit, maybe we'll start with you. Sure. I think a lot of people are familiar with the concept of antioxidants, but what they're less familiar with is what exactly something like oxidative stress is and inflammation. And so when people think inflammation, they often are thinking, oh, I have a hangnail and my finger's inflamed, or I hit myself with a hammer on when I was fixing something and that's inflamed. But chronic inflammation and oxidative stress contribute to cardiovascular disease and it's a whole body situation. But oxidative stress is also known to be detrimental to normal brain function Mm. and is linked to things like depression and memory loss and neurological disease like Alzheimer's, for example. So when people are thinking antioxidants, they can now get maybe a better idea of what are these antioxidants doing? They're actively going into the body and fighting against oxidative stress, which is a normal occurrence, Hmm. but you don't want it to be too overpowering. So including a lot of antioxidants in the body is one way to do that and getting those through fruits and vegetables primarily. Okay, great. And Mickey, let's hear from you about the heart health and the brain health connection. Yeah, it's a really important point because, you know, we've been kind of talking about heart health and brain health a little bit, a little bit of silos so far. And I think you know, I couldn't agree more that they are just intimately connected. And you see it uh, in when you look at the research that shows that there is a greater risk for things such as Alzheimer's and dementia if there is existing heart disease or, or other metabolic type diseases. So, Absolutely. Starting there and worrying about metabolic health first with healthy overall diets will certainly support healthy cognitive health throughout the lifespan. So, you know, when you look at something like eggs, eggs have now been included as part of heart healthy diets by multiple authoritative guidance uh, documents. You know, one of the more recent ones that I point to is the American Heart Association Science Advisory that came out in late 2019 that addressed the issue of dietary cholesterol and eggs in a heart-healthy diet specifically, where they stated that, you know, an egg a day, certainly part of a heart-healthy diet for healthy individuals, actually recommended up to two eggs a day for older individuals, you know, given the nutritional benefits, the nutrient density, and the high-quality protein, and then the same more eggs, perhaps for vegetarians who are not including meat-based proteins in their diets. And then you see the 2020 Dietary Guidelines, again, reinforcing that earlier this year. 
with including eggs and heart healthy diets. It's just, as we know, nutrition, that's where you start that metabolic health, heart health, and then that will certainly lead to cognitive health. But there's other nutrients that we're finding that are very directly related to cognitive health that I think are also important. Yeah. Even for me, it was kind of an aha to hear the words, what's good for the heart is good for the brain. I think that's just a really great concept that people can get, you know, pretty quickly. So it's great to hear some more of the background on that. And we're also hearing a lot more about something called the MIND diet, M-I-N-D. So I'd love to hear, like, what is the MIND diet? What foods are encouraged? Nikki, let's start with you. The MIND diet, it's really a combination of two diets. You know, so we've all heard of the Mediterranean diet. We've all heard of the DASH diet. MIND diet kind of takes a little bit of both of those. So, so it's the Mediterranean DASH intervention for neurodegenerative delay. Say that 10 times mm. fast. <laughs> uh, really, the MIND diet emphasizes aspects of both Mediterranean and DASH. And when you look at, again, the dietary guidelines has both a DASH style eating pattern, which they call the healthy US pattern. And they also have a Mediterranean style eating pattern, which emphasizes things like fish a little bit more. But there's 10 foods in the MIND diet that are really emphasized. And, you know, not surprisingly, the green leafy vegetables, berries, nuts, olive oils, fish and poultry, legumes, whole grains. So those of us who are, in, in, that's not news to any of us, but it really does emphasize those 10 core foods. And Kit, what would you like to add on to that? Something about berries, I'm assuming. <laughs> Yeah. Um, the MIND diet, I think, is fairly new to a lot of people, but a lot of people have heard of Mediterranean diet and the DASH diet. Mm-hmm. So putting the best of those two things together, I think, is a wonderful idea for people. Berries and specifically blueberries were studied in the research that supports the MIND diet. Although wild blueberries weren't singled out, they were lumped in with regular blueberries in that work. But blueberries in general you know, have long had a history of being linked to cognitive benefits and better brain and all of that stuff, brain healthy. So pulling out blueberries from the MIND diet is kind of natural because I think the research was showing specifically regarding berries, blueberries and strawberries, I believe, were shown to be probably the most beneficial berries out of the bunch. They probably Mm. also were the most commonly consumed. Mm. among the people that were in the trials. So we're pretty happy with that. When you think about wild blueberries and regular blueberries, a lot of people don't even know what wild blueberries are. So that whole concept. I was just going to ask you, (laughs) please enlighten us. Yeah, that whole concept of what is the difference between wild and regular? And there are a number of differences. All blueberries are good and good for you. But the difference between wild blueberries and cultivated blueberries is what we call them, or just the regular blueberry, stem from what they are. The plants are completely different. Wild blueberries grow on a rhizome under the ground. They are not, you know, six foot tall trees. They're like 10 inch tall plants Hmm. and they are not cultivated. They are not planted by man. They are truly a wild crop. Hmm. that grows primarily in New England and Eastern Canada. Maine and the Quebec area being two of the most prominent areas for commercial wild blueberry growing. So I always explain it to people this way. If you own property and you happen to realize there's wild blueberries on it, lucky you, because then you can sell those. And the majority of wild blueberry commercial ventures are family farms and family run properties. Hmm. You luck out if you get them because you cannot plant them and hope that it grows and takes over. So that's one of the differences. And actually that particular difference is believed to be pretty impactful for the nutrient content, specifically the antioxidant content, um, the polyphenols, the flavonoid levels, things that are shown to be fighting that oxidative stress that I mentioned earlier. So because wild blueberries are wild, they actually have to be able to fend for themselves a little more than a cultivated blueberry, which I always say is a little bit more pampered Mm -hmm. um, because they're sprinkled with water and, you know, they've got nutrients added and things like that to the soil. And wild blueberries, they don't do that stuff. So what you get is what you get. And the only thing they really do to them is mow them down every couple of years to help the plant grow better. But because they have to 
survive on their own in the wild, they end up having a higher concentration of those antioxidant nutrients, those polyphenols and things like that. So they're hardy. Mm. And that hardiness brings with it some benefits, mostly in the in the antioxidant realm. Other differences would be taste and size. Wild blueberries are significantly smaller than a regular blueberry. I also like to say they taste more blueberry-ish. <laughs> I really just explain it as they're like a concentrated blueberry. Mm -hmm. So if you want to think of it that way, that really does make sense because they're packing a lot of nutrients into a smaller package. The taste components are into a smaller package. So it's just an easy way to think about it. But those are some of the main differences. Okay, thank you. Yeah, that makes sense. I'm glad you explained, like, because they have to work so hard as they're growing. Yeah, that is why they make more of their antioxidants, if that's the right way to say that. Yeah, because those compounds are protective to the plant as well. Right. Okay, great. Well, along those lines, then I've long known, I think everybody knows that, you know, blueberries are the fruit with the most antioxidants. Correct me if I'm wrong on that. No, you're correct. And wild blueberries are the highest antioxidant fruit among the commonly consumed fruits. Great. So let's continue along that conversation then. Can you tell me more about what the research shows about the wild blueberries and brain health specifically? Yeah, there are numerous studies. There's over 20 years of studies, um, more like 30 years at this point, showing benefits of the consumption of blueberries and wild blueberries for every age group. Initially, the area of study was with older people and things like dementia or, you know, cognitive decline. Mm -hmm. And the newer research is being done with children around the grade school age and also teenagers and people in middle age. So we're finding and I say we as if I'm the one doing the research, which <laughs> I'm not, but um, the Wild Blueberry Association does sponsor studies, as does, of course, the Cultivated Blueberry Association. Mm -hmm. But they're finding that there are benefits throughout the lifespan. And I'll speak specifically for wild blueberries. Much of the focus on the cognitive benefits is due to the flavonoid content, particularly the anthocyanins, which you may, mm. you know, are the uh, pigments, the blue and purple pigments that are found mostly in the skin of wild blueberries and regular blueberries. And because wild blueberries have the most anthocyanins of any commonly consumed berry and fruit, that is believed to be what is driving some of these benefits in addition, once we eat those anthocyanins, they are metabolized into different compounds. And those metabolites are now being studied. And we're seeing, oh, where are those metabolites being deposited? Well, a lot of them are deposited in, in the brain mm. and, you know, other areas of the body. But I think the research is developing more towards what are these metabolites doing? And then the other half of that is who exactly can benefit from consuming more blueberries and wild blueberries and why? So it's a very broad area of study. Mm -hmm. But one thing that comes out in the research is that wild blueberries are showing benefits for things like memory, executive function, which is, you know, your ability to do daily tasks, make decisions, organize your thoughts and pay attention and things like that, manage your emotions. That's executive function. So memory executive function are two of the primary ones, and then also staving off cognitive decline. Mm -hmm. That's a long-winded answer, but that's... No, that's great. Part of the study area linking wild blueberries to cognition. But I think the biggest point to make is that there are benefits at all age groups. Mm -hmm. And I would imagine that's the same for all of the foods that are listed in the Cognition Kitchen Guide, because that's mm -hmm. the focus of the guide is what can we be eating to improve our cognition at pretty much every age. No, I love hearing about the research and so does my audience. So thank you. And it makes sense that the initial research would be looking at older populations, but it's exciting to see throughout the entire lifespan and you know different ages, there's probably different mechanisms and different things going on. So that's really exciting. Yes, absolutely. And the other thing that's interesting about that is a lot of nutrition research does with cognition and nutrition and cognition research does tend to elucidate 
connections between the difficulty of the cognitive task and the testing substance. So for example, in some of the wild blueberry research, we use a blueberry powder, which is basically just freeze-dried wild blueberries ground up. That's all it is. Mm. And you mix that with water, which is the typical way it's given to the study subjects. And they're finding that, you know, kids who are having wild blueberry drink, we call it, or beverage, are finding that they can pay attention better, that they have faster response times, even just within two hours after drinking it. And they'll retest that, you know, the next month and the next month, and they're finding that that's a benefit. But for older people, the benefit seems to be more memory enhancement Hmm. and some aspects of executive function. But because memory is very complicated and there are different aspects of memory, that seems to be a more interesting to that population. Mm -hmm. And the other thing about this research is that the harder the task, the easier it is or the more impact you see from the intervention. Interesting. So that's kind of interesting. Yeah. So the harder the task that they give the children or the adults or the middle-aged people, the better impact they see. Excellent. Well, before we move on to Mickey, I also wanted you to talk about the fiber because we know that berries are a really great source of fiber. Oh, yeah, they totally are. (laughs) Most berries are a great source of fiber. As far as brain health, I don't usually link the two together, but we do know that eating adequate fiber is important for metabolic health considerations and things like, you know, diabetes and heart health. You know, fiber is important for everyone. Mm -hmm. So it's a really great thing that we have more fiber than regular blueberries, for example. And a lot of that is due to the fact that they're smaller Therefore, you're getting more berries Mm. per cup or per serving. Right. Um, So, yeah, they are a high fiber fruit. I'm always saying on the show, we know people are not getting enough fiber. We know people are not getting enough fruits and vegetables. So just more reasons to include those in the diet. So, Mickey, let's talk about the research on eggs and cognition. What are you seeing in the research that is new since we talked about this on podcast episode 131? Yeah, so uh, for those that were able to listen to the previous episode, you might remember that we talked a great deal about two nutrients that you find in an egg, and that's choline and then two additional lutein and zeaxanthin. So let's start with choline. You know, we discussed last time, you know, the importance of choline for neurocognitive development. It's a really important nutrient for making those neural connections, particularly in the early stages of life. There's really great research that looks at the amount of choline consumed by expecting moms, and then connecting that to significant improvements in cognitive outcomes in the children later in life. So there's several observational studies that make the connection between choline intake during the second and third trimester, and then linking that to higher choline intake during those periods, linking that to improved cognitive function scores in children at various stages throughout development. There's been some about one year of age, there's been some up to seven years of age where they're still measuring the impact of maternal choline intake during pregnancy. And one of the most important things that, you know, probably something new is uh, how choline was reviewed by the dietary guidelines Mm -hmm. most recently. And the dietary guidelines advisory committee, and then the actual guidelines that came out six months later, right towards the end of 2020, listed choline as a nutrient that poses special challenges. Hmm. What does that mean? It means pretty much none of us Hmm. are achieving the choline recommendation. That didn't matter what life stage we were talking about. Pretty much everybody is under consuming choline. So that's why I received that distinction as a nutrient that poses special challenges. And it's even more difficult because the choline recommendation increases during pregnancy. Mm-hmm. And so the last data that I saw were less than 10% of pregnant women are actually meeting that adequate intake level of choline. Wow. And what's most exciting about choline, I mentioned the observational studies, but you know, those of us that follow the nutrition research, we know the observational studies they cannot determine cause and effect, and so we know the limitations there. But mm-hmm. then when you start to see randomized controlled trials that match up with those observational studies, then you start to feel really good about what you're seeing. And that's what we saw with choline in a study that was sponsored by a nutrition center at Cornell a few years back, uh, where they actually provided choline to pregnant women to try to increase the amount they took to even double the recommendation. 
versus those who just achieved the adequate intake. Mm. And just comparing those two groups, the children from the moms that were doubling their adequate intake versus those that just met the adequate intake, they were able to measure significant differences in processing speed at 12 months of age. Uh, and they're still following those kids. I saw them, uh, they haven't published the data yet, but they still have significant results that I saw them present at American Society of Nutrition that showed that they're still seeing that impact uh, years down the line. So choline, again, something we are not getting nearly enough of. And when you read the dietary guidelines, you see choline now being reviewed and recommended right up there with all the other nutrients that we all know about for pregnancy, right up there with folic acids and iodine. That's also important for brain health, uh, which eggs are also an excellent source of iodine. So that is, to me, uh, a really significant news that's coming out of the dietary guidelines. Number one, we're not getting enough. And number two, uh, critically important during pregnancy and early life. And just to reiterate another authoritative guidance, the American Academy of Pediatrics lists choline among several other nutrients as critically important for development during the first thousand days. So that mm. is certainly when it comes to eggs, eggs are an excellent source and the highest concentrated source of choline among commonly consumed foods as well. I think only beaten by some fish like salmon uh, and chicken liver which maybe not too commonly consumed these mm -hmm. days. So uh, <laughs> choline, an easy one to get from your egg. Another thing, uh, just real briefly, lutein and zeaxanthin, which are actually carotenoids that are responsible for the yellow pigments of the yolk. Uh, and we, it seems like we have a concurrent theme here in pigment because mm -hmm. we see the anthocyanins from the blueberries responsible for the purplish blue mm -hmm. tint of the blueberries. And then we have the lutein and the zeaxanthin and carotenoids that are responsible for the yellow pigment. You know, I think those of, again, in nutrition, you always hear, you know, eat the rainbow, right? Mm -hmm. Whether it's, you know, blueberries, whether it's the egg yolk, whether it's your dark green leafy vegetables, when you're getting colorful foods in that have some of these bioactives that are responsible for those pigments, that's a good thing. And so lutein, actually, we know about lutein because uh, its relationship between lutein and eye health, and there's been studies that have shown uh, mm -hmm. reducing risk for macular degeneration. But you know, when we consume lutein, we actually increase our macular pigment. You can test this through a non-invasive method. It's called macular pigment optical density. And we see increases in MPOD when we consume carotenoids like lutein. Uh, there's been studies that have shown increasing egg intake leads to a measurable increase in MPOD. But what now we're seeing is that macular pigment linked to cognitive outcomes. So higher macular pigment, optical density, higher cognitive function scores. We've seen this both in school-age children that have our MPOD has been linked to academic performance in studies that have been done at University of Illinois. And then we also see this later in life as well with higher macular pigment being associated uh, with reduced risk of cognitive decline. So uh, a couple of different ways in which the nutrients in eggs are being linked with cognitive outcomes, both at the early stages as well as the later stages in life. And we're seeing observational studies as well, later stages of life, where we're seeing choline and eggs being shown to reduce cognitive decline. Actually, some really interesting work out of the Framingham cohort that showed actually had brain scans in the Framingham cohort, the scans where they can determine where there is uh, some increased risk for Alzheimer's disease and actually showed through these particular type of brain scans where they measure a particular white matter density that there's actually less of that when you have higher choline intake. So again, some really cool research, both at the beginning stages and stages of life. Uh, a lot more going on right now, though, trying to understand how eggs specifically are impacting these life stages, you know, because we don't eat nutrients, we eat foods. Mm -hmm. uh, so we have a lot more work to be done, but really exciting stuff. Very interesting. And yeah. how exciting that the dietary guidelines, this was the first revision that included the birth to 24 month period. Right. So right. there's a lot there to unpack. Oh, a tremendous amount. <laughs> and eggs were a, a fundamental first food. Mm -hmm. for that, that time period, birth to 24 months. And for really two reasons, you know, eggs were right there with nuts and seafood and no coincidence that those three were together because those three are potentially allergenic. Mm. So now we know this is different than we thought, you know, I have a 12 year old daughter and when she was born, we were still keeping back potential allergens. We were, you know, it was, yep. it was a little, we were concerned. We didn't want to go too far too fast, but now completely opposite. Now we want to introduce those allergens early. Mm -hmm. uh, as soon as those fits are ready for solid foods, mostly on average around six months, but you know, every kid is different. We introduce those allergens early that reduces risk 
for allergy to those foods later on. We've seen that through great work on peanuts and, mm-hmm. and eggs also following that work and then seafood as well. So those are critically important to get those three foods as fundamental first foods. But in addition to that, the nutrient density you know, comes along with that. So you get the choline from the eggs, which is also coming. Not only does egg make a great first food because you know a scrambled egg or, or mm-hmm. chopped boiled egg that an infant could pick up and have that experiential eating uh, event, but also the nutrient density of the choline, the lutein that's coming along with it. Mm -hmm. Excellent. Yeah, I I did a podcast episode uh, related to the peanut allergy and the early introduction. So I'll link to that in the show notes as well. And I believe that screening eye test. It's MPOD, macular pigment optical density. I believe the Egg Nutrition Center did that at a fancy conference. We did. Yes, it was quite fun. I didn't get mine done. I was standing in line and then I had to go somewhere else. But I found out from my 23 and me that I am at increased risk for macular degeneration. So it's a good thing I love my eggs and my egg yolks. But yeah, well, hopefully when we have in-person fancy again, you'll come by and you'll get tested. Yes, I'll be first in line. The fun part about that is because you go to fancy and we're all in nutrition. And, you know, we're competitive. What's your score? What, what's <laughs> yeah. your number? You know, yeah. you know, what's your blood pressure? What's your MPOD? You know, so I made it a lot of fun. Very cool. Well, you had mentioned uh, seafood and nuts, and I know that the Cognition Kitchen Guide and the Mind Diet also emphasize seafood, nuts, and the leafy greens that you mentioned as well. So I'd love to touch on those briefly in, in the relation to brain health, since it is part of this guide that we're sharing. So Kit, would you like to share some information with us? Actually, do you mind if I bump back to the vision topic? Oh, sure. I thought that was fascinating when Mickey just shared about vision and brain connection. I honestly did not know that connection. That's really interesting to me. While blueberries also have a vision benefit in Mm. that they help your eyes recover after exposure to bright light. Right. And also... They help your eyes by lowering the blood and fluid pressure, which can help decrease the likelihood of cataracts. Whether or not, while blueberry vision benefits are linked to cognitive health, I do not know, but I think that's a fascinating area. Maybe I should look into that more and see if I can find someone who can put those two things together for us. Oh, I'm glad you brought that up. I actually think blueberries contain lutein also. Uh, I did a little bit of a quick literature search before we got yeah, on today. It's, yeah. So, I mean, they that's do. another the commonality between blueberries and eggs. We're both coming to the table with some lutein. Yeah. Who knew? <laughs> yeah, right? I'm glad you brought that up because I remember hearing about the Blueberry and Vision uh, connection a couple of years ago, I think also at a fancy uh, meeting. Yes. And that work was primarily done, I would say, in Canada by a researcher named Willie Kalt, who tends to be the expert in that area. And I think I should get with her on whether we should be connecting that to cognition benefits too. Absolutely. Okay, great. Well, I'm glad you jumped in with that. I appreciate that. So yeah, if we want to just talk about seafood, nuts and leafy greens before we move on to some more takeaway tips for people regarding shopping and cooking. Yeah, absolutely. Well, seafood benefits for brain health. The first thing I think of is omega-3s. Omega-3s are something that most of us or most Americans are not getting enough of, and a lot Mm -hmm. of people don't get enough of. But in order to enhance brain development from young age and also brain function getting older, seafood is an excellent, especially fatty seafood, is an excellent source of that. Mm -hmm. Also iron, protein, all of these things that can be utilized for cognitive health. So two seafood meals a week obviously is still recommended. And some of that should be the fattier fish, you know, the salmon, the tuna, mackerel, those kinds of things. Mm -hmm. The nuts absolutely heart healthy. They primarily have uh, monounsaturated fat in them, which is, you know, not linked with any unhealthy heart (laughs) heart impacts. Mm -hmm. It's a heart healthy fat generally. And they even have a, I believe they have a heart health claim related to, you know, basically a handful, an ounce or ounce and a half. I think it is ounce and a half of nuts for their heart healthy claim daily. And I think this is an interesting point is the frequency of consumption. And I think Mickey touched on that earlier regarding eggs. But I think for all of these things, the nutrient density of your diet and increasing the nutrient density of your diet 
goes a long way to benefiting your heart health and your whole body health. And I think that's something that we could be emphasizing more to consumers in that what can we be adding? How can we enhance the nutrients that are in our diet versus just thinking about calories or fat content or one or two different aspects? So the nutrient density, um, I think, is a big part of all of these different foods, the greens, the nuts, the seafood, the berries, the eggs. Um, If you think about it, they're highly nutritious foods, incredibly nutrient dense. And I think that point also about daily needs to be made. Mm. With wild blueberries, they're showing daily consumption is preferable to, you know, eating them more frequently is better than less frequently. And also, it doesn't take a whole lot. And I think that could be said for pretty much all of these foods. I mean, an ounce and a half of nuts is just a handful. Mm -hmm. And for wild blueberries, we're finding cognitive benefits from like a half a cup to a cup a day. Well, a half a cup is easily put into a smoothie, you know, or Mm -hmm. a lot of other applications in the kitchen that you might want to try. So it's not like you have to go overboard with all of these different foods. So just to make sure People are realizing I don't have to eat, you know, 10 cups of greens. It's not about that. It's about increasing variety and making sure you're getting a lot of nutrients. Right. The commonality is these mind diet foods and the Cognition Kitchen Guide, you know, they're nutrient dense, or I like to say nutrient rich, and the variety of nutrients that when you put all of these foods together, and and great point on the frequency. So you started talking a little bit about smoothies and things like that. So I'd love to share with the listeners if you have any specific tips for shopping and cooking or, you know, incorporating wild blueberries and eggs into the diet. So, Mickey, how about we start with you? Well, obviously, eggs are a staple in everybody's refrigerator, right? But I think one of the things that I think is really important when you're thinking about eggs is, and we kind of touched on this a little bit with variety, but it's combinations, that I think could be really beneficial Mm. when we're talking about eggs. And eggs pair so well with so many things. They pair so well with vegetables. But when you look at some of the research that we've done, we've actually looked at pairing eggs with vegetables and looking at nutrient absorption. Because a lot of these nutrients that we're talking about, whether it's the carotenoids like lutein and zeaxanthin or lycopene from tomatoes or other um, colorful bioactives from the deep green leafy vegetables, a lot of those are fat-soluble. And so it is usually pretty helpful when you're consuming those with a healthy fat source. So what we found is when you consume eggs with vegetables, you actually increase the absorption of lutein, zeaxanthin, and some of the carotenoids that are actually from other foods as well, from some carotenoids that don't exist in eggs like lycopene. So if you mix your tomatoes in there as well. So, Mm -hmm. um, So I think that's really key for me is making sure that you're getting your variety, you're eating the rainbow, so to speak, which is maybe an overused, uh, phrase, but it's how you make these foods delicious and it's how you make your vegetables delicious is by pairing them with tasty things like eggs or even pairing your, your hard boiled eggs with your berries, or your fruits at lunch. You know, that's a great kid's lunch right there. Uh, you know, something easy to prepare and, you know, think about how nutrient dense that is. Absolutely. And Kit, what about blueberries? You already talked about the, you know, the frequency and smoothies, of course, but any other shopping tips or cooking tips you can share. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Um, that was a really nice idea about their mention, uh, Mickey, about the kids, because kids love wild blueberries. Something about the tiny aspect of them is very appealing. Mm-hmm. Um, they also taste really good. But yeah, for shopping, the thing is with wild blueberries, the harvest season is about two to three weeks. So if you want fresh wild blueberries, you pretty much have to live where they're grown, (laughs) which Mm. means the vast majority of people have to get their wild blueberries in the freezer section because Mm. 99% of the crop is frozen. But that's not a big deal because it's, you know, nationwide and overseas as well. There are frozen wild blueberries. The thing is, you need to make sure it says wild on the package. Otherwise, you'll be getting regular blueberries, which... You know, if you're looking for wild, just make sure you see wild on a label. The other thing is if you're going to defrost these for any reason, like for cooking purposes, you'll notice that um, a regular blueberry defrosts and sort of deflates too. Mm. They're very watery. There's a bigger percentage of water in them. That doesn't happen to wild blueberries. They keep their shape, 
which is why if you're going to bake with them, for example, make a muffin or a coffee cake or something, that you'll see that they're still shaped like our little round berry versus just a blue streak in <laughs> in your baked good. <laughs> so that's an interesting aspect. And a lot of professional bakers prefer them for that reason, because they just look better in the finished product. Mm. But as far as shopping, as long as you see wild on the package and you find them in your freezer section, that's good. They also are great as a frozen food. I know this seems weird to eat a frozen product while it's still frozen, <laughs> but kids like it that way. A lot of schools use frozen wild blueberries on their salad bars for that reason. Mm. And they tell us that they have to keep refilling it because they really like them when they're frozen. <laughs> and I, I kind of get it because you can sprinkle them around better that way. So if you're making a salad and you throw on wild blueberries in their semi-frozen state, it's a really nice contrast in textures and you still get the good flavor. My daughter used to eat them just in a bowl, mm -hmm. like a sorbet, but not blended. You know? mm. um, and they're good that way, too. And you can just throw them on, you know, pretty much anything. I know smoothies are very popular. That's the most popular type of recipe on the wildblueberries.com website is our smoothies. We have probably 100 recipes at this point. The other way that people like to eat them is like on cereal, granola, yogurt. You can also think about them in, with savory foods. So like Mickey alluded to, you know, thinking out of the box with how can I, what can I serve this with that's not typical. Wild blueberries make an excellent sauce for things like chicken or pork. Those tend to be things that you might make more in a colder month, more of a fall or winter dish. And in the summer, I put them on salads all the time. I also put regular blueberries on salad. I just like blueberries on salad. It's an amazing combination. Mm. But I do obviously prefer my wild blueberries. I'm just out at the moment. Mm. <laughs> I used my last ones in a crisp <laughs> just, this, oh. just this week. I bet you could make a really nice wild blueberry sauce for salmon. Yes, you can. Yes, you can. And of course, as a dessert sauce. But you can think beyond the sweets, too. That was the point. Yeah, salmon, chicken, pork. Mm -hmm. Anything where you have a sauce, you can use wild blueberries. And they, they really make an excellent sauce. And it's very easy. And we know that frozen berries or frozen fruit in general is perfect for smoothies because then you don't have to use a bunch of ice, you get more right. flavor. And I love any time that we can promote produce that is also wonderful frozen. So that's great because it stores longer and it's usually more cost effective. Right. I mean, wild blueberries fresh are super hard to find. And, you know, you do pay a premium price because it's a premium product. But when you can find it frozen in the grocery store and it comes in a giant three pound or five pound bag, depending on where you're buying it, you're going to have those for a long time, especially if you're just taking a scoop each day. It lasts a long time. So it's a fun product to just keep on hand. I just have to add, blueberries are a staple of my children's lives. I mean, I have two daughters. They're <laughs> eight and 12. And they've been eating blueberries like they're going out of style since they were babies. And my, my I don't know if they're wild blueberries, so I don't do the shopping, but we'll just say blueberries in general. <laughs> and uh, my oldest to the point where when she was little, like her teeth started to turn colors and we were first time parents and we <laughs> were freaking out. Like we took her straight to the dentist. What's going on? Why is our daughter's teeth turning colors? And the dentist looked at us and we're like, does she eat a lot of blueberries? And we're like, yes. <laughs> and we're like, wow, <laughs> you know, crazy first time parents. But anyway, but That's yeah, but cute. they still have, a, like my wife still gives them like a tiny bowl of blueberries as like a side dish at dinner. And I promise you, there have been times when they have had, because we do breakfast for dinner a lot, there's been eggs and there's been blueberries at the same time in front of them at the dinner table. So very apropos that we're doing this podcast. <laughs> That's so cute. That's I love excellent. it. I love it. I love hearing how your family is enjoying these different, wonderful, nutrient-rich foods. So thank you for sharing that. So as we're wrapping up, I would love to just share with our listeners kind of like the bottom line regarding brain healthy diet and lifestyle, because I know there's some things in the Cognition Kitchen Guide that are beyond diet and nutrition. So Kit, do you want to share some tips with us? Well, I think the point of your question about uh, lifestyle is very important because it isn't just about what you're eating, right? It's also about getting some regular exercise, getting adequate sleep. Those two things, I think, are a couple of the most important. Maintaining a healthy body weight is also another one that is, you know, important for brain health throughout 
you know, towards your older years. But yeah, I feel like lifestyle measures, including increasing the nutrient rich foods in your diet, are super important. And then also increasing variety and remembering that you can do this starting at a young age. It doesn't take a huge effort. It's all about small little changes and tweaks to your diet that you can start at any time. So you should not feel that, oh, just because I'm now 50 or whatever, because I'm in my 50s, that I'm Mm -hmm. too late. Now, granted, it is more beneficial if you're like Mickey's kids and have been, you know, eating these brain healthy foods their entire lives. Mm -hmm. That seems to be, you know, a better way to go. But if you haven't, it's not too late. There are benefits shown from eating these foods in the older years as well. Mm -hmm. So it's never too late or too early. And it also doesn't take a lot. So just keeping it real as far as not overdoing anything, but then giving thought to your entire lifestyle as well. Thank you. I'm so glad you mentioned the point how it's never too late, uh, because that is really important to share. Mickey, what about you? Any other lifestyle aspects that are good for our brain? Yeah, just to build on what Kit said, I think she hit all the major points. But you know, what's good for the heart is good for the brain. All the things that we talked about, what's good for heart health, what's good for metabolic health, it's going to be good for the brain too, just like we talked about with the mind diet. There are some things that you can do specific for your brain, and these specific nutrients. We talked about choline, we talked about eating the colors, you know, the purples from your blueberries, the yellow from your egg yolk, the green leafy vegetables. So good for the heart, good for the brain, eat your colors. And then as you mentioned at the beginning, my graduate training is actually in exercise physiology. So I'd be remiss if I didn't emphasize that aspect <laughs> of what Kit mentioned with exercise and keeping your brain fit as well as the rest of your body. Actually, exercise this morning because I knew I was going to be on a podcast and get grilled with good questions. And I feel <laughs> feel feel good about it. <laughs> You're prepared. Right. Oh, yeah. I love the exercise aspect because, you know, I talk about this on the podcast all the time, but between my ballet and my karate is just as cognitively challenging for yes. me as it is physically. And, I, you know, I just feel really good about that. So, yeah. Well, and it, it clears your mind too at the same time. You feel ready mm-hmm. to do other things when you've done it. Right. I think that aspect of exercise is so important and often overlooked. The stress reduction aspect mm-hmm. is not just about burning calories or building muscles. It, de-stresses you, like you were just saying, Mickey. And also your point, Melissa, about the um, cognitive, you know, how hard you have to think when you're doing some certain activities. You know, they're finding, you know, that, you know, those brain games and things like that, that you can play, not necessarily super wonderful, going to keep you cognitively perfect for your entire life, but challenging yourself through learning new things all the time. Mm -hmm. Um, reading new things all the time. Those kinds of activities, keeping your brain stimulated is important. And then also the social. We forgot about the social time. <laughs> oh, well, it's been a little difficult yeah, uh, for right. the past year or so. Yes, it has been difficult. Now we're able to be more social now. Yeah. Zoom social time isn't as fun, definitely. But now that we're loosening up and getting back to normal and vaccinated and all of that, increasing our social connections is so important, especially in your later years to not drop your social connections is important for just keeping, you know, their finding, keeping your cognitive health intact. Absolutely. So I say make some wonderful food with wild blueberries and maybe a quiche with some eggs and go have a social occasion. (laughs) There you go. Absolutely. Well, and as far as learning new things, I hope that all my podcast listeners find that this is also stimulating their brain health um, by learning new things on the podcast. Yeah. Well, thank you both so much for being on the show, sharing the science and the insights on eggs and wild blueberries. I'd love to share some information with our listeners on where they can find more information. I know that the Cognition Kitchen Guide is at cognition-kitchen.com. But if each one of you want to talk about your respective websites and what people can find on those, that would be great. Sure. You can go to eggnutritioncenter.org. And it's where healthcare professionals and can join our egg enthusiast program and get more information on the latest research and plus resources and recipes. Great. Yes. And wildblueberries.com. Very simple. That's where you go for more information on specific research areas. We have an entire content hub on brain health, which has references and also obviously a link to the Cognition Kitchen Guide 
which is a free resource for people in case someone was wondering. It is free. We also have many, many recipes and other aspects of health and culinary links are discussed there. Yes, tons of recipes on both of your sites and within the Cognition Kitchen Guide as well. And thank you for mentioning that it is free. Yes, it's a free downloadable. And again, I'll have all those links to everything in my show notes at soundbitesrd.com and as well as both of your social handles for Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, and all of that. Great. Well, thank you again for being on the show. It's been a pleasure talking with both of you. Thanks so much. Thank you. So fun. And for everybody listening, as always, enjoy your food with health in mind. Till next time. For more information, visit soundbitesrd.com. Music by Dave Burke, produced by JAG in Detroit Podcasts.